Hello, this is Dr. Sherry Coleman coming to you live from Cassidy campus and just wanted to share some time. Actually, you see I'm on the, the football field and wanted to share some time because this will probably be the last time that we're on Cassidy's campus as a parent. Um, my our oldest Chandler left uh, last year, completed his junior year at another school and has done extremely well. And this year we're pulling our seventh grader. Um, I do believe there's a conversation that needs to be had. It, it has been had um, in closed um, conferences and closed rooms, but I thought it was time um, to actually bring the conversation to a larger audience. And so, yes, I've sat on, uh, been on the board of visitors for several years now, there were some conversations when I first came about diversity and how do you meet the needs of every student. Um, I found that over the years that conversation has, has since changed and the focus is no longer there. And so rather than having a private meeting um, behind closed doors with just two or three people, I felt it necessary, my husband and I felt it necessary to stop for a moment. And although this information may not ever help our children, they won't because again, this is the last week of school. And so our last one is, is exiting. Um, but hopefully it will, it will help um, any African American student that comes behind, any Latino American student, any Native American student, any Asian, anybody else from any other culture. I just think it's, it's a conversation about diversity and cultural sensitivity that needs to be had on the, the campus of uh, Cassidy. So let me just share with you um, our experience. First, let me let me let you know that this is not a gripe session. Um, if you follow any of my work, if you read my book, you read my blogs, you've seen my videos on YouTube, you know that I'm an authentic person and you know that I, street, I, I speak truth to power. And so my, my point is to elevate conversation. My point is to enlighten you. Um, it is, again, not a gripe session, not talking badly about anybody, but saying if you want to take it to the next level, there are some things that you really need to consider. So our experience, um, the Coleman family, our oldest, Chandler, came in um, fifth grade, was so excited about being here on the campus, um, started right away. Of course, there was a difference between uh, public education and private uh, college prep. And so, you know, fixing those gaps, moving, just, just, just getting used to the system. And what we decided to do was to bring our second grader over so he did not have a, such a large gap. So he'd, he'd have the lower division experience and then the middle division and then the high school experience. Well, it's interesting because the, when we first, um, his second grade year, we um, had the opportunity to learn of 89er day. And because my husband and I are both professors of the University of Oklahoma in the African African American Studies program, um, the more, we're not from Oklahoma, so the more we began to read and understand um, what 89er day was and what it celebrated, we became concerned. And so I immediately went to the Native American Studies, my colleagues down at the University of Oklahoma, only to learn that Norman Public Schools, it had been two years that they stopped having those celebrations because it was in fact offensive. And so although it did not affect my culture personally, my background, I went to the lower division um, director at the time and said, listen, I'm struggling. I'm really struggling with this. How do we celebrate this? And she assured me, we are teaching the kids the entire story. We're teaching the children, you know, the, the trail of tears and how, how wrong it was, but this is how Oklahoma came into being. And so she gave enough information and, and the, the information that I received from my second grader um, kind of put my mind at ease just a little bit because I at least said, you know, the conversation is being had. Yes, this was a horrible thing. Uh, um, the, the founding of Oklahoma, uh, what it did to Native American um, people. and But I thought it enough for the lower division when she said, you know what, but let's teach the entire story. So we let it go, moved on. Cortland celebrated with his second grade class. We did not isolate him, but allowed him to participate, and we kept moving. And so I was hopeful that, that okay, great, here's some conversations that we're having about race, about culture, about um, cultural sensitivity, about diversity. Which is very interesting, um, when our oldest Chandler came in his fifth grade, my husband and I both steeped in this um, information, not just because we're African American, but because we teach it, because we're in um, multicultural studies, we understand the importance of understanding every child for who they are. And so we offered articles, we offered books, um, how to teach the African American child, how to realize that difference does not equate um, to deficient. 
And many times in the larger society, if one group or one person does something differently, it's seen as a problem as being deficient. So we really thought by, by giving those tools, by giving those resources, that somehow um, the converse, we would not have to have some conversations because we would all be at a level of understanding to realize that Chandler or Cortland or any other African American child or Native American child or Asian American child um, has a different way of learning, has a different way of coping, has a different way of relating to people. And if we all have that understanding, then we then this place would be a place that would meet the need that could possibly meet the need of every every child. So we go into that. Seventh grade, however, began to change for Chandler. And it was at that time, please excuse the wind, I'm out in the elements. Um, the conversation began to change because he began to come home and um, say, Mom and Dad, I don't want to be a Cassidy anymore. And we were just saying, listen, boy, get it together. You know, get in there, study. You can do the work. You're capable of doing the work. What we didn't understand that it had nothing to do with his ability to do the work. But what he was referring to were the daily microaggressions that he was facing. Right? What does that mean? So, um, here on this field, if you all you all recall on, on varsity night when the football game is going on, most of the kids in lower division and middle division are playing on the soccer field. And so I believe it was in sixth or seventh grade he came to us and there was something going down with the, with the two boys or the, the teams were fighting and Chandler stepped in and broke it up. And somehow, I don't know, he yelled or something, and I get a call Monday morning from the middle division, middle division director saying that um, there was a little girl who felt threatened um, by Chandler, and so she was not coming to school on Monday. And so rather than calling the parents, she called the middle di division director, which now it becomes a thing. That's a microaggression because as African-American men in the society, we already understand how they are perceived. If you know Chandler, if you've ever seen Chandler, he is a gentle giant. But, but for his classmate to somehow feel threatened that he, one African-American boy, in the midst of all of these other kids who are fighting against each other, breaks it up and yells for someone to feel threatened, that you don't know what that does to the psyche of African-American children. We didn't realize. Well, actually we did, because my husband and I then went into uh, the middle division director and began another conversation. I, I can recall just different in instances where I get an email from a teacher, um, you know, your gender complimented me and I didn't feel comfortable. Are you serious? That's what we do. If I like your tie, I say, hey, doc, that's a nice tie. I like your shoes. However, because this teacher did not understand that Chandler was not coming from a place of, of being funny, of coming from a place of, you know, trying to be comical in the class, um, but he seriously liked his tie and we express when we like something that's a microaggression because now you're saying I don't understand you and it's different and something is wrong I feel uncomfortable so anyway so we go on with that we're still you know he still hangs in there but he's still like mom dad I don't want to be here um, but of course Cortland is having a different experience as, as he's coming through freshman year fast forward um, Chandler, again, you know that he plays. He, he, as a freshman, could play to the level of um, the varsity team. And so as parents, we probably should not have let him travel. But because he had the ability um, and they allowed him to, we said, hey, let's go with the varsity team. And so he traveled. So his freshman year, he traveled back and forth to SBC. When other freshmen were home studying, he was putting everything down on the court or in the field, um, whether it was basketball or football. And we didn't realize that when he came back, there was not true academic support for him, which is interesting because, again, my husband and I teaching at the University of Oklahoma, we have student athletes who go, um, go to mandatory study sessions. Um, we check in periodically. I have the, their advisors to email me and say, hey, are they on top of things? They do their own group things. So they, they understand, yes, I'm doing something for the school. The student is doing something for the school. Let the school do something for the student by making sure your grades stay on the level. So, yes, here is Court, I'm sorry, Chandler, this freshman boy traveling. And, of course, here's what's funny. That year, his freshman year, the, the football team made it to the SPC championship. Who scored the winning? Well, I'm sorry. We did not win, but who scored the only touchdown for Cassidy? the little freshman boy <laughs> who probably should have been home studying. 
<laughs> but okay, we live and we learn. Anyway, if, if we're college level, if we're, if we're college preparatory, then some of the things that they offer on college campuses for student athletes, for, um, for outliers, for people that don't fit right in the box, need to, need to be offered here on, on this campus. Anyway, fast forward to sophomore year, he tears his ACL um, after the, the football season. And honestly, although it was painful for our family, painful to watch him go through, the, through that, it was the best thing that could have happened to Chandler. It was the best thing that could have happened to the Coleman family because I think it was at that time that we stopped looking through, uh, what do you call it, rose-colored glasses. We really began to look at um, Cassidy and, and some of the teachers and some of the coaches um, and just, just some of the things that fall through the cracks. And so here he is recuperating after giving everything for the, for the team, for the school, and not receiving that same support when he has to undergo surgery or when he's out for a couple of weeks. Um, just from if I played for you on the field, then surely you would have called me and, and texted me just like my husband is um, chaplain for the Oklahoma City Thunder. And so they knew that um, Chandler was going through surgery. They called and texted him, didn't ask my husband, didn't ask me, asked for his number to call to speak to him. We have people that have played in the NFL that have gone through OU and have gone on. They knew, they called back. But the very coaches that Chandler played for and got hurt under, they did not. That was painful for my 10th grader. That was painful for him not to receive that same support. So again, we begin to look at those things like, mm, this is a great school, but something is missing. Something is missing for, the, for, for our children. About that same time, our younger son is then called in. We're called into uh, the middle division um, saying that she was concerned, pulls out this rap sheet. Um, I don't know if you, you understand, um, some weekly, if, if children are having difficulty, there's this weekly report where every teacher turns it into the middle division director, then um, the secretary then sends it out at the end of the week. But what it turns out being is a rap session. So instead of the communication being between the teacher and the parent, now the conversation goes from the teacher to the middle division director, then to the parent. And when the parent sees it, it's now a rap sheet, not just grades, but now it's behavior. Well, he looked over here, he wasn't focused. I don't think he wants to understand what I'm saying. So here, here I am trying to do um, the work. I'm called in, again, my difference uh, or how I learn or may I, I may be struggling instead of the teacher coming to the parent and saying, hey, help me out. Now the parent is taken out of that equation to the back end of it, and now it's seen as a problem. Now your child not only is, is having issue in the class, but mm, he might be a behavior problem. Really? Really? So that doesn't that doesn't work for me. And then teaching out of one of the chapters, medical apartheid that I teach in my African American health issues class, we talk about that. There was a, um, some studies done in Baltimore uh, on the East Coast where if one child came through and there was a concern or, or um, they automatically targeted the second child. And we felt that. And of course, this is talking within the African American community. And so we felt that at that moment when we were called into the office and some of the same concerns um, about Chandler, she now raises about my second child. There's a problem here. And in fact, my husband had to excuse himself from that meeting so as not to get upset because we had, we had just really seen enough. And it was time he needed to, to distance himself from the conversation um, just a little bit. We then called a meeting with the headmaster um, to discuss cultural sensitivity. Um, by that time, we didn't realize that well, the middle division director had already gone over and told about the story because she knew something something was wrong. She knew Mr. Coleman was upset. And so um, she mentioned it to uh, the headmaster. Um, and it, so so as even we're, we're sitting in that conversation, the the question was asked, are you saying that she should have asked you in a more genteel manner? And we paused for a minute and said, it, it's, it's not about the manner in which it was asked. It's about understanding, once again, that different does not equate to deficient. One of the things, I used to teach high school chemistry before I was down at OU. One of the best teacher in services I had was about um, learning, uh, teaching different learners, how to teach the auditory learner, the visual learner, the kinesthetic learner. And it's funny because I was teaching high school chemistry. I stopped for an entire week. I had A classes and B classes. And I began to, to um, give examples of each, um, what, it, what how, how, 
excuse me, what helps a visual learner, what helps an auditory learner, what helps a kinesthetic learner. And I changed my entire chemistry room. I also enabled the children to find out how they learn best. And so my kinesthetic um, kids who have to tap, you know, you ever have a child that, that taps the pencil on the desk all the time, or if you notice them walking down the wall, wall hall, they have to touch every locker. That's kinesthetic. That means I have to, you can't just talk to me. You have to give me some hands on. And so I, so my kinesthetic, again, because we're in a chemistry lab, I have high tables at the back. I was able to move my kinesthetic learners to the back of the room. So if they needed to stand up and get the same information that the visual learner who needed to see the board at the front of the classroom, everybody got the same information. So I had to learn how to adapt my teaching to best serve the students in my classroom. Once I had that training, once I did that time with my class, grade soared, people felt empowered, my kids felt empowered, and if you looked at my classroom, it looked different from the other classrooms. So I understand um, different and deficient. I understand that it does not mean the same thing. So here, here we are. Um, my concern, or my, the concern of my husband and I, um, that the teachers are not educated to the cultural needs of every student. Um, I think we believe that a smaller class size meant that we would have more time, um, more one-on-one -on -one interaction. However, if, if I have a class size of 14 or 15 and I'm struggling in math class, why should my parent have to go out and get a tutor when you're the teacher and there should be some time that you can sit one-on-one? -on -one? I thought really that was the point of private school. So why, why go to a private school pay tuition, and then still have to go out and get an outside tutor. Unless there's a, just a breakdown between the teacher and the student. But really, I think that's something that, that, you, that we have to, to honestly look at. It, it really makes no sense. And many, of, if you were to ask many um, parents on this campus, I've had many conversations, they do actually have their kids in tutoring. For a class size that's 15 or 16, where the teacher should then always be accessible, right? Anyway, so moving right along, again, this is our, our experience. So here after our 10th grade um, year for our oldest, um, he uh, did not come back. A contract was not offered. We did not come back. Um, and he spent his junior year at a place where he felt loved, where he felt supported, where he has blossomed. He, funny thing, he is not playing football, nor is he playing basketball. He is a baseball and a golf player. And so, like I said, the touring of the ACL moving location help him to see who he really was and not who everyone else expected him to be so that that helps us to look at even our youngest coming up and and so not buying into the notion of oh, okay you have this body type you do this you do well at this but that's really not who you are as an individual so our parenting has even changed um, in this last year so this year our seventh grader coming along um, again having a total totally different experience um, social, <laughs> Cortland is just all of that. Um, but then again, when the, when uh, middle division director dangled, rather than really asking, how can I help you, kind of dangled the contract, well, he's not doing, we said, you know what, you're not equipped. You're not even equipped to deal with it. So let's move. So so the question was asked even from some time ago, hey, Cortland, did you, did you give up? I think his mom finally said, hey, we're done here. Um, and so we are moving, moving on. Why do I tell you this? Not to bash anybody, not to um, disparage anyone, not to um, not to cause a stink, but really just to say, open your eyes. Because we talk about the mind, the body, the soul. We talk about treating the entire student. But if you're not equipped to, to teach and um, to empower the entire student body, then are you really living up to the mission of Cassidy? We're actually in the process, my husband and I do both do some writing. Um, we're in the process of writing an article why the best school may not be the best fit for your child. And so congratulations to Cassidy for, for being the best school in Oklahoma. But let's, let's honestly um, go back and look and see uh, why it may not be the best fit for uh, people of color, for of African-American children. I used to, we used to always sing the praises of Cassidy, and honestly, I cannot uh, anymore. I, I will not actively recruit um, African-American families and say, hey, you need to check it out. Private school is a great thing. Um, I can't do that. And, and, and let me just give you a couple of concrete reasons why, and then we'll move on from there. One, there is no system in place 
to address the needs of different cultures. Um, you need a trained individual. If you go to any business um, in, in Oklahoma, there many times is a diversity specialist, a diversity trainer, someone who is a director of diversity, who has gone through the training, who can deal with different um, races, cultures, sexualities, all of that. There's no one on this campus that has has any of that training. So I honestly, if you have not been trained in diversity, why am I bringing you into a, into a population or recommending that you go into a population that can't meet your needs? Okay, so that's just something to think about. Director of diversity, um, either having continue, even someone that's already here and having them to do the continuing education, but I can't do that. If, if, if um, you're not willing to, or I'm sorry, not you, Cassidy as a whole, not one person, but if Cassidy as a whole, as a community is not willing to say, you know what, as the nation is changing and developing, our schools changing and developing, we need to make sure that we can meet the needs of all of those who come here. So one, I can't recommend anyone because there's no system in place. Two, um, let's really think about it. If this is a college prep school, um, there are some differences between uh, Again, my husband and I teaching at the University of Oklahoma, so we only teach on certain days. You begin to look at how the curriculum is set up on a college campus. Um, yes, college prep does not mean I just do a year head work and just do a lot of work. It means I'm strategically moving. So um, if I teach for the semester, I teach Monday, Wednesday, Friday, the same thing. Those students have those classes Monday, Wednesday, Friday. If I teach on Tuesday, Thursday, it's just Tuesday, Thursday. If it's a three-hour class that I'm teaching, at, that's only offered once a week. And so I really begin to look at your curriculum because it's really not college prep. You're just doing extra work um, uh, that they may be doing on college level, but you're not really in alignment with how college um, classes work, how college schedule um, schedules work. Number three, as an adjunct professor, both my husband and I, we have different experiences that we have on um, professionally and in our careers. And as an adjunct, um, that means I'm bringing my experience, I'm bringing my degree, I'm br I bring my medical background and my science background and my African-American, my diversity background, whether I'm teaching African-American studies or women and gender studies, I, also in that, in that department. Um, but as an adjunct, there are certain things and privileges that I don't have at, that a tenure track um, professor has. And so my work experience is valuable, but it does not allow me to go through the same doors that a tenure track professor does. So let's look at Cassidy, because here we are as a college prep school, and we have directors of divisions who have no terminal degree, who have no master level degree. Experience may have been wonderful, but there's no master level degree. There is no special certification. Um, but it's understandable at lower divisions. So have somebody that just comes straight out of college, they're teaching. By the time we get to middle school, honestly, we need to be looking at someone with a college degree and master's level. By the time I get to high school, then I'm looking at PhDs. I'm looking at definitely master certifications or special certifications. But then again, if, if I have division, division um, directors who have no formal training in education, um, and all I can say is I have the experience, I've done this for a number of years, then really there's, there's stuff that we're missing because the, that means the faculty and staff, we're not getting the newer cutting edge um, academics and how to teach and how to associate with students um, of various backgrounds. So that's through. I can't send you here when the people that I'm sending you to um, don't have that degree, education, certification, and I'm just resting on my laurels as um, having done this for several years. Okay, and number four, um, we have to intelligently, the Cassidy family has to intelligently deal with um, race, racism, cultural sensitivity, and multiculturalism. If you think about it, on this school, on this campus, at, as fourth graders, we have sex education talks. At seventh grade, they come back and do the more uh, focused sexual education talk. We offer technology safety. We talk about cyberbullying. So why do we not have a discussion about race and, and cultural sensitivity, especially with all of the things that are going on in the society today? Why would I not? Um, just a very recent incident. Here's my seventh grader. Um, because we're not having conversations safe conversations about race and culturalism and multiculturalism and diversity. We had an incident where my seventh grader in their class, as kids write their names on, on the desk, there's one desk who um, 
that has the initials KKK. Let's pause for a minute. Okay, there's no one at the school that has the initials KKK. We understand what it is. And especially where it was, where it was placed um, around another child's name, there were some other things that, that took place. So yes, they, um, they discipline the child, the child. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm sure that was an educational process for that child. My issue was the desk was not removed. So the next day, my seventh grader went in and saw the same KKK. And the next day, my seventh grader saw the initials KKK. And the next week, that same desk was in the classroom. So how could I imagine had someone been touring the school, had come and happened to come in that class and saw the letters KKK. Not saying that it shouldn't have happened, um, because it shouldn't have. Not saying that the child shouldn't have been disciplined. The conversation, could, that, that could have been a, 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 a great jumping board had someone been trained to come in and say, listen, this is what this is. This may not be your experience today, but you have to understand what historically what that means and why we can't just go around use, writing, carving those letters in a desk, how that is inappropriate and how that might make your, your classmates who you laugh with every day feel uncomfortable and not wanted. It's painful. So no, the incident happened. My issue is the teacher nor the director moved the desk out of the room and had a conversation. Again, I have nothing to gain by recording this video. I'm sending it to you um, because um, I want you to begin to do some soul searching, but then connect with other people on campus. We're not going to be here anymore. So that's, <laughs> that ship has sailed. I would have loved to have this conversation, this open and honest conversation. But there are other parents on this campus. There are other African-American parents on this campus. There are um, even some our international students. There's a, there's a level of diversity and cultural sensitivity that you have to um, have on campus to meet their needs. And so uh, we just felt, my husband and I felt it was time to bring it to your attention. Again, thank you for the time um, that my children um, spent here, the family. I've made some wonderful friends who will continue, we will continue to be friends. Um, even as our children matriculate through different different schools, I'm excited about their future again. Um, like I said, Chandler went to another school, blossomed, and I'm expecting the same thing for Cortland because I have amazing boys um, who were born to very conscientious parents who speak truth to power. And so this is our effort to speak truth to power, to let you know that although it may be the best school, it cannot be the worst school for African-American children or children of different cultural backgrounds. So um, again, thank you. Um, if you have any questions, that's fine. You have my email. You can email me back. I don't, um, I don't, again, because I'm not an angry black woman, I'm not looking for apologies. I'm not looking for um, anything. All I want you to do is to have the conversation around your kitchen table. Then elevate that conversation. Come on the Cassidy campus. Hook up with other parents. Hook up with other administrators. Hook up with other teachers who really want to have an authentic conversation about diverse, diversity, cultural sensitivity. If, if, if I'm feeding the mind, the body, and the soul, that means all of that has to be connected. So um, understanding the tiny microaggressions that I feel actually impact my soul. And it's a painful, <laughs> it's a painful uh, impact. And so if we really want to look at empowering our kids to be the best that they can be to elevate their thinking, then I believe that us as parents, um, those of you as administrators, as directors, as teachers, as faculty, it is now time for you to raise the level of conversation. So yes, so Cassidy can be the best school in Oklahoma City, wonderful. But you can also say, you know what, it's the best school for any child who wants to work hard. And again, different does not equate to deficient. Have a wonderful day, enjoy um, this Oklahoma wind and air, God bless. Take care.